Hello everyone, my name is Anne Frost, uh, I work for Sheffield Libraries and I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Robin Simpson, who has created an interactive performance workshop to celebrate planet, planet Earth and all the wonders of nature. So I'll pass over to, to Robin. Hello everyone, nice to see you. Uh, my name is Robin and I'm a storyteller and today I'm going to be doing some stories to you about the wonderful world that we live on, planet Earth and all the animals and things like that. And there'll also be um, a quiz about halfway through. We're going to run about 45 minutes. There's going to be a quiz about halfway through. And if you would like to throw me the answers in the comments section that's to the side of the computer screen so I can see the answers to the quiz and hopefully, fingers crossed, that will work out just fine. We're going to start with a story. The Empty Pot. It's called The Empty Pot. And this is a folk tale all the way from China. It's an old tale all the way from China. And it bears some similarities to the first story I told you, because you see, it's about the emperor of China. And the emperor of China in those days was a very, very old man. And he had a problem. And his problem was, was that he had no children to become emperor after he had gone. What am I going to do? He thought to himself, and he worried day in and day out about this issue. And one morning, he was wandering about the palace gardens. What am I going to do? He thought to himself. He liked the palace gardens though, they were full of pretty flowers and bees and birds. And the palace gardeners, the emperor admired the palace gardeners, the way they could make things grow out of the ground, the way they could make vegetables grow for people to eat pretty flowers. He just thought, how on earth do these gardeners do that? Ooh! And that's when the emperor had a clever idea. It was perhaps the best idea the emperor had ever had. So the next day, there was a royal proclamation. <laughs> and heralds were sent out to all the villages and towns, and posters were put up on doorways for people to read, and they said, by royal decree, any child wishing to become the next emperor of China must visit the palace tomorrow morning and take away one seed. In six months time you return to the palace with your beautiful fine flower and the person that has grown the most beautiful and the most fine flower will become the next emperor of China. <laughs> Well, you can imagine all the excitement. All the parents going, oh, my child might be the next emperor of China. And all the children going, oh, I might be the next emperor of China. It's so exciting. And so the next morning, the palace courtyard was filled with hundreds and hundreds of people all thronging round, chatting excitedly. Chatting, 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 chatting. Children and grandparents and mums and dads and brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, hundreds of people. And then a gong sounded, gong, and a horn blew, and the great palace gates opened, and the emperor came out, hello everybody, and he came up to the people with a big bag, and in that bag were seeds, hundreds and hundreds of seeds, and the emperor himself gave one tiny seed to each child that was there. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Like that. Now, there was one child there, a little boy, and he was called John. And John was considered to be the best gardener in his village. Oh, he could grow the most beautiful, the most fine flowers. He could grow the largest, most tasty vegetables. Everyone who knew John thought that he was sure to win this competition and be the next emperor of China. So John waited patiently and eventually he got to the front of the queue and there was the emperor handing out seeds and John was given a little seed. 
and he walked home with it in his hand. <gasps> he clenched it tightly in his fist, like that. Not too tightly, he didn't want to crush it, but tight enough that he wouldn't drop it and lose it. And when he got home, he got a plant pot. And in the bottom of the plant pot, he put some little pebbles for drainage so the seed wouldn't get too wet. And then he filled the rest of the plant pot with compost and he placed the tiny royal seed on top of the compost and then put a little bit more compost on top and then he got his little watering can and he watered gently the seed. And then he put the pot down like that. And he waited. Many days passed. And all over China, little green shoots were starting to appear out of the children's plant pots. Hundreds and hundreds of little green shoots like that. And soon, after more days, they got taller and taller and little green leaves started to appear on those shoots. But John's plant pot was empty. Nothing was happening. He didn't know what was going on. Days passed and now little buds were starting to appear on hundreds and hundreds of seedlings, little buds that eventually opened out into beautiful, fine, sweet-smelling flowers. But John's plant pot wasn't doing anything. It was empty. Well, there was some soggy compost in there, but absolutely nothing. And John didn't know what was going wrong. He moved it into the sun in case it wasn't getting enough light. He moved it into the shade in case it was getting too much light. He changed the compost in case it wasn't good enough. He fed it fertilizer. He, he talked to it. He watered it more. He watered it less. He had no idea what he was doing wrong. Six months passed. And the day came to show the emperor everyone's flowers. And once again, the palace courtyard was full of hundreds and hundreds of people. Moms and dads, children, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, grandma and grandpas. Hundreds and hundreds of people. And the gong sounded, bong, and the horn went, and the great doors opened, and the emperor came out. Hello, everybody. And there stood hundreds of people all holding their beautiful and fine flowers. And the emperor himself wandered up and down the lines of people, inspecting their flowers. Mm -hmm. He would say to one, and he would say to another. But he looked a bit grumpy. Instead of smiling at all these beautiful flowers, he had a frown on his face. Mm -hmm. John was there too. He was somewhere near the back of the line. He had brought an empty plant pot. Despite his best efforts, despite months of trying, he was unable to grow anything from his seed. And he'd come to show the emperor that he couldn't do it, that he'd failed, and to apologise. And eventually the emperor got to John. What's your name, little boy? asked the emperor. John, said John. And why? Have you brought me an empty pot? And John explained that no matter what he did, no matter how much sunshine he gave the seed, no matter how much he watered it, no matter how many times he changed the soil, he just couldn't get the seed to grow. And he'd come here to admit that he couldn't do it and to apologise. The emperor said, hmm, I see. And then the emperor turned and addressed all the many hundreds of other people. The seeds I gave to each and every one of you six months ago had all been cooked in an oven and no flower will ever grow from a seed that has been cooked. Therefore, you've all cheated. Well, I all accept this young man, he said, pointing to John. This is the only boy, said the emperor, brave enough to admit that he couldn't grow the seed and to come here and apologise to me in person. Therefore, I name... What's your name again? John. I name John the next emperor of China. And you know what? He did. And that's the end of the story, The Empty Pot. 
I hope you enjoyed that as well. Now then. Oh, hello. I've got some comments. Hello. Hello back. Hello, Samuel. Very good. Thank you. Thumbs up. Oh, thank you. Hi. OK, I'm glad you're chatting with me now because we're going to try a little bit of a quiz. And I need to see your little answers down in the chat box there. Is that all right? Brilliant. Thank you. OK, let's give it a go. Have a little sup of water and then we're going to do uh really wild wildlife quiz. <laughs> Fantastic. OK. We are going to talk about, let's see, let's talk about lifespan. The creature or one of the creatures on Earth that lives for the shortest amount of time is something called a mayfly. And I don't know if you know, but if you go down to canals or lakes or a pond, often in the late afternoon, early evening, you'll see lots of little flies, tiny little flies all bobbing about together like that. And they could be mayflies. And mayflies only live for 24 hours, for one day. In fact, some female mayflies only live for a few hours. They live for such a short amount of time that they don't have mouths. There's no point eating, you see. There's no point eating because they don't live for long enough. They live for about 24 hours. So that's one of the shortest lived creatures. But can you, in the chat box down there, give me your answers if you can tell me what you think the longest lived animal might be. Have a little think and then see if you can put down there what you think the longest lived. <gasps> Lara says a giant tortoise. Shahan says a panda. These are good guesses. Tariq says a tortoise. And so does Jessica. Fantastic. Tort These are good guesses because giant tortoises can live for many hundreds of years. Adam says a whale because it's so big. A lion from Martin. Sarah, a tortoise or a whale. Samuel says a jellyfish. Now, Samuel, I think you might be right. I'm going to show you a picture of this little creature. This is, of course, a jellyfish. Um, and it's a particular type of jellyfish. The Latin name is Turritopsis dornii. I think I've got it right. Turritopsis dornii. But it's more commonly known as the immortal jellyfish. Yeah, good job, Samuel. Absolutely. The immortal jellyfish. And the reason it's called the immortal jellyfish is because if a little bit of this jellyfish came off, perhaps if it's attacked or if it injures itself, a little bit of this comes off that can become a baby jellyfish. And then that baby jellyfish can grow into an adult jellyfish. And this is the important thing. That adult jellyfish is exactly the same as the first jellyfish. Its DNA is exactly the same. It's a clone of the original jellyfish. In theory, this jellyfish can live forever. For Ever. That'd be a bit like if you chopped off your finger and then a whole new you grew out of your finger. It's that crazy. But it's brilliant. The immortal jellyfish. So a mayfly lives for less than a day. The immortal jellyfish can perhaps, perhaps live forever. Yes. Thank you very much. OK. That is how long things can live. Let's talk about size. Some dinosaurs got to be huge, didn't they? I mean, those big brontosauruses and brachiosauruses, they were absolutely massive. But can you tell me, what do you think the largest creature that's ever lived is? What is the largest creature that has ever lived? And I'll give you a clue. It isn't a dinosaur. Let's have a look. A T-Rex. Brilliant, says Hind or Hind. Is that how you pronounce it? I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, Isabel says a whale. Lara says a blue whale. Oh, Lara, I think you might be right. Or a mammoth. They were big, weren't they? Big and shaggy with huge tusks. A giant whale, says Samuel. You're very right, Samuel. Adam says a blue whale. You're absolutely right, guys. Here we go. Here's a picture of it. And Shahan says a blue whale. Here we go. That doesn't really give you the scale, does it? A whale, a humpback whale. You're all going for whales. It's great. But this is actually a blue whale. And it is huge. It is bigger than the biggest dinosaurs. It is, it's the largest thing that has ever lived on our planet, ever. And it is alive today. Although it's 
quite endangered, of course. Very rare. But it is the largest creature that has ever lived. It is so large that its tongue, ah, its tongue weighs the same as an elephant. Its tongue weighs the same as an adult elephant. That is how big a blue whale is. Interesting fact about elephants. Elephants are the only animal that can't jump. Did you know that? Elephants are the only animal that can't jump. So there's an interesting fact for you. Every other animal can jump, but not elephants. They can't do it. Right, now let's talk about dangerous animals. That's crazy. I know, Jessica, right? Let's talk about dangerous animals. Which is the most dangerous animal on planet Earth? What do you think? What do you think, guys? Tariq, you knew that. That's amazing. What is the most dangerous animal on planet Earth? You're all having to think. A cobra, says Martin. Jellyfish, jelly, king cobra. Smilodon, oh. Ah. A dung beetle, says Adam. Interesting. Uh, as Isabel, a dinosaur. Shehan, a crocodile. A Komodo dragon, they're really dangerous, aren't they? A T-Rex. Tariq says, a mosquito. And so does Hind or Hind, mosquito. And Lara says, a boa constrictor. Well, let me show you a picture. Those are all fantastic answers, by the way. A scorpion or a snake. Yeah, lots of you have said snakes. This is a snake called the Inland Taipan, or the Inland Taipan. And it lives in Australia, in the middle of Australia. That's where the inland bit comes from, in the desert. So you're very unlikely to see one unless you go tramping through the deserts of Australia. And this thing is so venomous that one bite from this snake can kill you a hundred times. A hundred times! Why is it that poisonous? Adam says humans are the most dangerous animals. You know what, Adam? You might be right. It is scary, isn't it, Martin? Yeah. So you don't want to be you don't want to be treading on one of these. The thing is, it's quite shy and it's more scared of you than you are of it. So it'll probably swirl away if it ever hears you tramping towards it. But yes, this thing is the most poisonous creature on Earth. It can kill you a hundred times. RSKP has said, do you know what the biggest jellyfish is? It's the lion's mane. It's a hundred feet long. That's incredible. The lion's mane jellyfish is a hundred feet long. And I'm five foot eight, so you can, there you go. You know how long that is then, don't you? Yeah. However, a bit of a trick question, really. Some of you got it right. I asked what the most dangerous animal on planet Earth is. And some of you answered that it was a mosquito. And you're absolutely right. A mosquito in itself isn't dangerous. But if you go to countries like Africa, they often carry a disease called malaria. And it's the disease that they give you from biting you that kills so many people. And mosquitoes kill 725,000 people a year on average. Many, many hundreds of thousands of people mosquitoes kill. So the most dangerous planet on Earth is not your brother, as Tariq says. <laughs> Who is your brother six foot, Tariq? Uh, I'm not. Um, the most dangerous creature is not Tariq's brother. It is a mosquito. Although I'm sure Tariq's brother comes close. Um, okay, one last question. Bit of a trick question, this. We all know what this is. This is a polar bear. I've got a little polar bear there on my little diorama. Here's a polar bear. Trick question. What colour? Is a polar bear's fur? What do you think the answer is? What colour is a polar bear's fur? White, says Shahan. White, says Martin. White, says Isabel. Jessica. Black, says RSKP. Adam says colourless. Tariq says brown or grey. Grey, says Sarah. Samuel, yellowy white. And Hind or Hind says no colour. Well, a couple of you are absolutely right. It is, in fact, colourless. It's a kind of, well, they say I'm going grey, but at the side of my hair here, this whole, this little bit here, it's kind of colourless. It's got no colour at all. And it's the same with polar bear's fur. If you looked at it closely, maybe through a microscope, you'd see it's got no pigment in it. It's not actually white. It just reflects the light and the snow and the, the area around it. And it looks white. And the reason for that is a, a, a polar bear's skin itself is black. 
and that's so that it can soak up all the sunlight and all the warmth it can because it obviously lives in a very cold place and it needs to soak up all that sunlight and warmth through its black skin. If it had white skin, it would reflect the sunlight and the warmth away and obviously it doesn't want that. So it wants to soak it all in with this black skin. And if it had white fur, it would reflect all the light and all the warmth. So its hair is colourless to let the light through and its black skin underneath soaks all that warmth and heat up. And so it can keep as warm as it can in the Arctic. So yes, a polar bear, in fact, is not white. It is colourless, totally and utterly see-through like glass. So there you go. Brr, says Jessica, I know. Cream-ish, says Samuel. Tariq says grey. Yes, it is, in fact, colourless. And that's it. That's the end of my really wild quiz. I hope you enjoyed it. And that's the end of my storytelling session. Thank you so much for listening and contributing in the chat so well. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. Lovely. I'm going to hand you back to Anne now, who's just going to say a few things before we stop. If I can just say, I think everybody will agree that was absolutely fantastic. I've learned such a lot with the quiz as well. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much, Robin. I'm sorry about the delay, but it was definitely worth the wait. Absolutely fantastic. I think everybody will agree. Um, but yes, so if everybody can remember to, to go along to the local library, um, there's a load of poems and things there, and you can join the Summer Reading Challenge. Um, but thank you very much, Robin, on behalf of all of us. That was absolutely fantastic. Loved it. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure telling stories to you today. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Tariq. Bye, Shahan. <laughs>